how many owners have really come out and spoke on our behalf? How many of these college coaches have come out and spoke on our behalf that ride these black players in football and basketball to where they're the highest paid college coaches around the country and their programs are benefiting? Not too many. And to me, their silence speaks volumes. I'm Taylor Rooks, and these are conversations about defining one's relationship to blackness and how that defines their America. So, when did you realize that being black was different than being white? I learned early. Um, being biracial, born in San Jose, I was, you know, as, as early as I can remember, I was amongst black and Mexican kids. Um, but I moved to Sacramento at nine, eight or nine, and I went from predominantly Mexican and black to all white schools. So in third grade, um, being new at this school, I found out very early on that I was black. And it was because the kids wouldn't let me play anything. Couldn't play basketball with them, wouldn't let me play kickball with them, wouldn't let me build a football with them. And instead of, you know, poor me, hug and console when I went home, um, you know, my dad said, if they call you nigger, fight them. So I learned in, in third grade that, you know, if kids were, I didn't know it was racial or racism at the time, but if they called me nigger, because that's what the kids were calling me, to fight them. So I learned fairly early that my skin color made some people just not like me without even knowing me. How many fights did you get in? Oh, I got in so many fights that my mom had to come work at my school. <laughs> and my mom came and worked as uh, like a yard duty on her off time at my schools because it was constant. And I would tell the school and, and nothing would really happen. You know, so it got to a point where my mom was just on campus during the recess and during lunchtime just to kind of somewhat keep me out of trouble, but somewhat keep kids away from me that were, you know, harassing me. In what ways do you feel like you yourself are treated differently? Maybe not by kids, but just by the white people um, in the town that you lived. Um, that I was just different. You know, like I said, my neighborhood was, was multicultural. We had everything in my neighborhood, but my parents early on made a point to put me in better schools and, and better schools where I was from met, met white schools. You know, so I never understood why, you know, I was so like, why can't I go to school with my friends in the neighborhood and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was never allowed to. Um, and I guess it set me up long term to just kind of be more versatile and more of a chameleon. And even though, I, like I said, I'm, I'm half Italian, my first eight, nine years, I was never really around white kids, you know, so to be thrust into that position in third grade um, was a culture shock for me. Um, one, and then two, from the educational side, I went from being going into third grade in San Jose, moving, and then being in third grade in Sacramento, I got, and I realized what the educational system was like, too, because I went from third grade there to, they had some of my classes back in the kindergarten class, so I'm this big old Billy Madison type kid, <laughs> bigger than, <laughs> yeah. um, because the schooling where I was at was obviously below par. You know, so I, I learned very quickly at, a, at a, about age nine that color and race played a huge factor um, in my life. You know, you've mentioned, you know, being biracial, being half Italian. And there's obviously, you know, black people are not a monolith. Everybody's experience is different, just like everybody's DNA is different. Right. Not everybody's blackness is the same. Mm -hmm. Being half white and being half black, do you feel like you had to choose? Um, I never chose, and to be honest with you, I never really fit in because as a biracial child, you're never white enough and you're never black enough, you know what I mean? So I wasn't dark enough and I had this good hair. Um, and then obviously with the, with the white kids, I was, I was darker than them and just a different complexion and different mannerisms, you know? So I was never, I never really had anywhere to run, you know, now being biracial is more of the norm. And I think in the next 10 years, 15 years, everyone's going to be mixed up somewhat. But I was really old. I was by myself. I was on an island until I really got a chance. And I think through sports, once these kids, once they were finally tired of getting beat up, they finally allowed me to play with them. And then once they allowed me to play with them and I was the best, you know, football, basketball, baseball, kickball through sports is what that allowed them to get the chance to get to know me as a person. Um, so that was kind of the turning point 
and oddly enough, I still have friends from third grade that not necessarily that I got into fights with, but they were actually some of the first kids to kind of accept me and allow me to kind of show who I was through sports. And man, almost 30 years later, you know, I'm still friends with them. Now, of course, you know, being black and white, you have lighter skin. Um, so I kind of want to talk to you about colorism, not just in the the black community, but how white people respond to colorism um, or lighter skinned black people. Um, how do you think colorism has maybe affected your life and have you seen people respond to you differently because you maybe have more European features, you have lighter skin? Um, I don't think colorism has affected me as much as racism has. Racism has been heavier, um, although colorism does exist. And, and definitely I feel like in our black community, and when I say black, I feel like these days, if you have a drop of black in you, you're black. You know what I mean? So I learned at 17, um, 18, excuse me, right before I was about to graduate high school and go to UCLA in 1998, there was a situation in my high school where my sister was a sophomore and um, a boy was calling her nigger, spitting her hair, and I never ran into this kid. And finally one day, she came to me as my fourth period ended. I was going home for the day and, and told me this boy called me a nigger again and spit my hair. So I went and happened to just see the kid walking by. So I did what a big brother does, you know, beat him up, tried to go to the office and explain what happened, and they didn't believe me. So keep this in mind. I'm the number one football player, number one basketball player. Everyone knows that I'm going to UCLA. But here I'm in the midst of, you know, kind of a racial situation where the, my school doesn't believe me. So to this day, I don't give a dollar back to my high school because of this particular incident. So anyway, I get suspended for a week. And while I'm suspended, my school was vandalized by the KKK. So burnt down a, um, a bathroom, vandalized, broke windows, swastikas everywhere, died nigger. They had a mannequin hanging from the big tree in front of my school with, uh, with uh, my football jersey on that said died nigger. So I realized at seven or 18 that even though I was very proud to be biracial and Italian and black, that the world looked at me as a black man. So it wasn't, to, to answer your earlier question, I never really chose, the world chose for me. You said something I think is important, which is, you know, I was the number one basketball player, number one football player, but it didn't matter. Because I think a lot of times when we are, you know, in the heat of these racial movements, people will say, what do you know? You're this, you're that. America has afforded you these great things. You don't even know what it means to be right, like to have to be affected by racism because that's not what your life reflects. But they're not understanding that whether you're a football player, basketball player, famous person, you're still black at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I don't know if that is a thing that registers. Like racism doesn't have to do with your status. It simply has to do with the like color of your skin. You know, having younger children, I talk to them about that. And my twins are half black, a quarter Italian, and a quarter Mexican. You know, so they're very mixed. And I'm thankful from a standpoint of everything I faced growing up that you can't really tell what my kids are. And like I said, in 2020, it's more of, you know, biracial is, 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 is around a lot more than it was in the early 80s when I was coming up as a child because it was, you know, you were back were black you were white you were asian there wasn't really too much mixing going on at that time so you know i have conversations with my sons because they're old enough to understand stuff right now we talked about the george floyd stuff and simple stuff and and, and you know one of my sons asked me like so you're trying to tell me that someone's going to hate me just because of the color of my skin and i said i hope not but it, it's definitely a possibility you know so for children to kind of grasp that you know my kids aren't going to grow up like i grew up food stamps, drug-filled environment, abuse, obviously, you know, I've worked my butt off to, to put them in private schools and we live behind gates, myself and their mom live behind gates. So they haven't experienced it. Um, and I hope they don't, but I, I'm sure at one point um, they will. So I just kind of want them to be prepared. You know what I mean? I think we have to start educating our kids at an early age, knowing that this is a, this is a cold world. Although I feel now more than ever, we're at a turning point um, with this stuff and, and, and things are starting to get done. I still really feel that, that hate will never go anywhere because it's a taught trait and there's still too many people in this world that hate and, and teach their children to hate. So, you know, children turn into adults that hate. So I, I'm very open uh, with my kids when it comes to situations that they, they need to be aware of and, and, and race is definitely one of them. When you're talking to your kids, 
how often do you stress or do you stress that for them to maybe succeed or be accepted, they have to be excellent. And the reason I ask that is because I went to a talk where Lena Waithe was discussing her movie Queen and Slim, and there is a line in the movie where he's talking about how he wants to be the best. And she says, why do black people always have to be excellent? Mm. And I think a lot of that is because like she said, we think we have to be excellent in order to justify the space that we take up. Whereas, you know, I don't think white people, the majority of white people say like, you know, I have to be the best doctor. They can just be a, a doctor, you know, or I have to be the best teacher. They can just, they are afforded the luxury of not having to be exceptional at it because mm -hmm. they don't have to explain to people why they are where they are. Well, I just think the reason why that happens is because, you know, if we're lucky enough to get into these fields or these professions, we don't get a chance to make mistakes, so to speak. You know what I mean? So a person, a white person could be very comfortable being a doctor, lawyer, whatever the situation. And if you mess up, you're most likely going to get another chance. And I compare this really in, in sports and, and with black head coaches having to really be careful picking their jobs. Because most of the time where there's a, where there's a coaching change, it's because it's a bad team. So a white coach can go in there and be subpar and get fired and get another job. But a black coach, um, you know, you don't get too many chances. I think white people historically have been afforded the opportunity to fail up right. and black people just do not get to fail up. They only get to fail. And Damn. more than that, it's like when one black person fails, it's like all the black people failed. Right. They Where it's, yeah. It's, it's all completely, completely grouped together. But when you talk about, you know, how certain like white coaches have been able to bounce around, even if they're losing, they get new jobs. When we talk about diversity in sports or diversity in any workplace, it isn't simply so that you can have these numbers to check up that you have a person of color. It actually really does improve the place that you work because maybe the reason none of these teams are getting better is because you're continuing to hire the same people. Same Hiring hire different people would improve it. You know, so that's, I, I know we can cross over. We're just not giving the the opportunity to cross over yeah. but let me yeah, ask you what is it yeah, like yeah. for young black coming up in a space like this is that has pre predominantly been white women in, in your position or white men in your position that are doing these um this kind of stuff that you're doing yeah i mean you know i always say i take a lot of pride in the fact that I am a black woman who looks black. And I say that because growing up when I was looking at any woman on TV, specifically covering sports, they were white, blonde hair. And if they weren't white or blonde and they were black, they had long hair, little noses, very light skin. It was everybody on TV was almost tailored to make white people comfortable. Um, and I take a lot of pride and responsibility in being in this space and talking a lot about Black people, both for Black people and to Black people, because I think it's important and I wish it's something that I always had when I was growing up. But my experience is always going to be different than any man's, Black or white, Period. and definitely different than any white woman. Mm -hmm. But I find a lot of strength in that. You know, I tell people all the time, I think one of the biggest advantages that I have as an interviewer is that I'm a woman and that I'm black. I think athletes just inherently feel more comfortable talking to someone who looks like them. Do you find that, well, like you said, you found it to be a strength, but can it also be a negative point of view? Because one, you're a woman in sports, and then two, you're a black woman in sports. So mm -hmm. although you've turned it into a strength, was it ever a hindrance in your process? Or do you know any of your colleagues who were in the same position where it's, it's, it's held them back for those two reasons that you turned into strengths? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I'm very close with Carrie. I'm friends with Roz, Maria. We talk about these things all of the time. I would say the hindrance hasn't necessarily come from being Black as much as it has come from the perception of Black people or Black women. I think people over-sexualize Black women. Mm. And they have historically. It doesn't matter what we're doing, we become over-sexualized. Um, mm. And it, we are the only people that will be talking to a person or doing an interview and somebody says, ooh, like they'd be cute together. Or ooh, were they dating? Simply because we're two black people and black women.
it doesn't matter what I wear. I could be wearing a turtleneck and slacks and the conversation is about what I look like. And that is because we over-sexualize black women. And I mean that about white men and black men. That is something that I think black men have to be a bit better at um, is seeing black women as whole women and not just seeing them and the relationship to them, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. I never thought about it from that point of view. I've never looked at it and, and made those assumptions, but, you know, being friends with Carrie, you know, these are some of the conversations we have too. And she tells me, you know, that I'm wearing a simple dress with my legs out and all of a sudden I'm too sexy, but you know, my right. counterpart, same thing. And just cause she doesn't have as much sun on her, on her body, it's, it's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah, so very, absolutely. Very and I, I also think it, it's so, that conversation is so layered. But I think black women are left out of a lot of conversations. And I think Breonna Taylor is a perfect example of that, that she has been lost in a lot of ways in this movement. And I'm glad that now, you know, everybody is calling for her murderers to be arrested and maybe now have the Breonna law that was passed because of her. But how do you have it, me? What pisses me off, not to cut you off, but how do you have a law for her now, but haven't arrested the cops? That makes like, no sense. <laughs> those, those don't go together. Yeah, you're admitting there was some type of wrongdoing. But you haven't arrested. However, them. there's no consequence to the wrongdoers, and I just think that's crazy. Police report, which is insane. But go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, it's the the Breonna Taylor thing is just so sad, and you know, I any time I'm on my phone and I see you know black men dying, it hurts. But to see someone who absolutely could be you. Like Brianna Taylor is me, she's my friend. She is a black woman who was working and was just in her apartment. Um, right. And I think that that hit a lot of us differently. And I think black women just wanna to continue to, to be supported the way that black women support black men. I hear you, I hear you. No, like nobody goes harder for black men <laughs> than black women. If you ever listen to um, Tupac's song called White Man's World off the Machiavelli album, it, it says that, you know, black women are an endangered species. So you guys have the toughest job in this world, you know what I mean? To just, just exist, let alone elevate yourself. You know, like I said, because you're behind the eight ball twice. You yeah. know, you're a woman, you're black, and don't be a lesbian. You know what I mean? So then all three things are really stacked against you. So I take pride in seeing women like you and Carrie and Lena and, and, and Ava and all these women, you know, exceed expectations because although they're killing us and, and doing all this stuff, I still feel it's a lot harder for black women to climb the ladder, uh, so to speak, than it is for, for, for black men. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, you touched on something in there, though, that I, I want to get your opinion on. What do you think, or how would you describe is the black athlete's relationship with the media? Um, Seeing it from you as an athlete and now you as a media member I don't want of it. it. Because it, it's, I, I don't want it. I'm not even gonna make that analogy because it's not the right time. They just don't trust them. You know what I mean? And I think that's the reason why myself and Steven Jackson have been able to su succeed not only on ESPN, and Fox, but on our podcast, All the Smoke, because there's no hidden agendas. We're not looking for clickbait. We genuinely want to have a conversation with you and humanize you and show the world the other side of you. You mentioned Jack, and I just want to give you a chance to talk about maybe how you have been moved by him during this time, inspired by him during this time. Because I think for so many of us, it's just, it has been something in this movement that has been beautiful. And I think we've needed to hold on to some things that are beautiful. Yes. Um, and he's just, ha he's had some really beautiful moments that, that inspired us all. Um, you know, just as a brother of mine, he's, I, I couldn't have been more prouder than, uh, of him. You know, Jack is kind of, there was a misconception of who he was because the brawl at, um, against Detroit in, 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 in the mid 2000s. And I think he was labeled such as, you know, as I was labeled throughout my career as a thug, as a problem maker, um, you know, someone you can't work with, but you know, our teammates would tell the world everything but that, you know, we were always labeled as great teammates. They would always have our back. So to see his transition, one, shedding his old image and reputation, but then two, stepping into quote unquote, the fire with this, with this George Floyd situation, 
it, like he said, it wasn't something he planned. It wasn't something he wanted, but it was something that was put on his plate. And I think he's done a tremendous job of handling what's come with that. You know, I've been in this social justice space for maybe about four or five years. I did the Stephon Clark stuff up north in Sacramento, my hometown. And even though I'm, I'm, I'm doing stuff right and speaking on the behalf of the, the people who don't have a voice, you're still going to take a lot of criticism from people. And, um, you know, that's something that Jack is, is getting now, you know, so we're talking here and there. I know his plate is full, but, you know, I just hit him every once in a while just to remind the man of how proud I am of him, how much I love him and to really take care of himself. You know what I mean? Because this just all this negativity and I'm sure you felt it, too. It just it's disheartening and it sucks the life out of you. You know what I mean? And him to be on the front line still in Minnesota nearly two weeks later. Um, I just tell him, you know, to protect his essence, protect his, 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 his mental health, make sure he gets rest, make sure he's taking time for him because, you know, all this negativity is not good for anybody, you know, but he's doing it for a great reason, but there's still a lot of pushback and you see a lot of people talking negative about him and his family now and calling him an opportunist and all this kind of stuff. When at the end of the day, he's doing what's right and, he, and he's a part and he's going, when we look back on this in 20 or 30 years, Jack is going to be one of the main people that people think about as far as turning this movement you know there's obviously George, George Floyd wasn't the first and he won't be the last but I think for the first time in 400 years the world hears us and it's because this man was executed in front of us and the world saw it yeah. um so that that was the tipping point finally and although I never and you probably feel the same way I didn't agree with the looting and, and, and stealing stuff and burning stuff but at the same time they've always had a problem with every way we've protested you know what I mean yeah. we protested Silently. You got to do what you got to do at some point. Done marches. We cap took a knee and was blackballed. So, you know, enough was enough. And, and, and there were some casualties of wars and that was small businesses and stuff. But for the first time, they hear us now. And I think Jack's platform brought a lot of light to that. And obviously there was the Sean Kings and other athletes and other actors. But I think Stephen's connection to George Floyd made it, made it that much more special that he was a part of it and, and someone that's leading the movement forward. We talk about the movement. And the movement is now touching a lot of different areas. I had just reported that I had been talking to multiple NBA players, and they said that a couple of days ago there was a call with about 50 of them talking about what they could do. And tonight they plan on having a call with a much larger number figuring out what they want to do. Um, have you been privy to those calls and what is kind of the chatter? I know you talked a little bit about it. I, I don't really know what's going on in, in, in those conversations. I've had conversations with a couple guys that were kind of like, you know, do we play in, in, in the midst of all this, in the midst of the pandemic? Um, you know, but I really feel like right now more than ever, the black voice is heard, but the black athlete voice has never been stronger and may never be stronger. You know, so whatever they do, and, and the athlete in me obviously doesn't want to see them sit out. I miss basketball as much as everyone else does, as much as they do, and I want to see it get back to the court. But at the same time, being able to watch this black ball documentary of my Clipper team um, from 2014, being in the moment, obviously as players and feeling like we had a chance to win a championship, we wanted to play because we didn't know what the outcome of sitting out was, but we also didn't know the magnitude and the message it would have sent if we did sit out. You know, so I hope that everyone got a chance to see that and kind of learn because me looking at it six years ago, removed, being six years removed, I would have urged my team to sit out. You know, I was the one that came up with the idea of what to do as far as the jerseys and flip and all this kind of stuff. And we did have conversations about not playing and Golden State was on board with us as well. But we did. There was too much unknown. But I think now we're at a point where. Like I said, our voice has never been stronger. Um, although I don't want them to sit, I would understand if, if, if they sat out a game or, or did something to really let everyone know that this is not okay. We're unified and we need to be heard. So to get back to your point, I haven't been on those conversations and I, and I don't really pry. I, I'm someone, I, I'm a quote unquote OG now. So people would just randomly reach out to me, kind of ask me my, what I think and my thoughts. So I have spoke to a few players on that on that front and I don't preach I, I don't tell them to sit out I just kind of give them the whole magnitude of the situation and understanding whatever you guys do it's going to be powerful so just make sure you're, you're united in that movement mm -hmm. what would you say to Adam Silver if he asked you the best way to address racism <sighs> that's a good question I think all the teams should start a fund you know, and, 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 and really, and, and individual funds for their cities 
and, and, and look to help their communities, not just put out PSAs or cheap PR things of, of guys saying stuff because, you know, how most of the stuff goes that's talked about and then a couple of weeks later we get back to real life and kind of forget about it. I would love to see each team start some sort of fund that is community based in their city and it can go to a number of different things. Whatever that team feels is lacking in their minority, in, in the minority culture of their cities. Um, you know, I had a phone call with um, Rob Palenka maybe two weeks ago out of the blue and he kind of just hit me up like hey Matt how, you know we're looking for things to do as a, as the Lakers uh, you know as a as a uh, as an organization to really unite and, and be a part of this movement and, and be an effective part of this movement and it kind of took me off guard I'm like the Lakers are calling me to ask yeah. what I mean so <laughs> I told him, I was like, man, that's a heavy question. I'm a, I got Zooms and I got my kids. Give me till the end of the day and I'll send you some ideas. So I sent him some ideas. But the first thing I said earlier is just like, this can't be just a PR move to save face. You know what I mean? This can't just be, let me let me put a Lakers statement out. Let the Lakers know you're with us. To me, either don't say nothing. Or if you get in, you got to really get in. You got to be entrenched. There's things you can do. And I gave them a list of things they can do. And I'm going to probably talk to them this week to kind of touch base and, and see what they decided. But you know, to me, you got to be all the way in. And, and it's seeing that the NBA is so progressive and, and we usually are the ones that are first to do stuff and, and people follow. I would just love to see each team start a fund because, you know, these organizations are making so much money off these players. And all the players have tremendous contracts. You got to think if our, our contracts are so well, how much are the owners making? You know, if they're able to pay Steph and LeBron and these guys $200 million a year, yeah. excuse me, $200 million contracts, imagine how much money these teams are making so you start these funds and consistently doing stuff don't give me a one-time donation make it a make it a you know a make this a cornerstone of your franchise make it a quarterly yeah. thing make it a once a year huge donation but let's build something from here and that's what i was trying to tell the lakers is if you guys do something trend setting or or groundbreaking you guys are the lakers so i think other teams are going to fall in line not only in basketball but professional sports across the board so it's going to be interesting. I've always been a fan of Adam Silver and his outside the box thinking, but I think the NBA is so progressive. It has to be something that's heartfelt, that's meaningful, that won't just go away, you know, once we're done talking about George Floyd. Yeah. And you're right. The NBA is so progressive, probably the most progressive of the leagues. I think Adam Silver is a fantastic leader and the things that he has done for the league. You, however, were in the thick of a scandal with the league when everybody found out that, you know, Donald Sterling was racist. Right. But I guess, and I mean symbolically, how many, if any, Donald Sterlings still exist mm. in NBA front offices? A lot. A lot. And not only in the NBA, in the NFL, I know for sure. You know what I mean? So it's just, and I don't, you don't want to give names, but there's that, that good old boy group of owners that were oil or real estate guys. These guys are in their, you know, seventies, late sixties, seventies and up. And that's just how they were raised and how they were brought up. You know what I mean? And they look at players as, I didn't want to use the word slave. That's harsh, but just, these are my, like, a kind of a plantation view or mentality. Like these are my guys. I pay them. I, I like Donald Sterling said, I get them cars. I get them food. I get them houses. The, he wasn't the only one to think like that. He's just the only one dumb enough to get caught. But I guarantee there's owners in these leagues. And in particular, if you look at it, how many owners have really came out and spoke on behalf of us and not a generic, like Roger Goodell read off the thing and still didn't even address the cap situation. But how many owners have really come out and spoke on our behalf? How many of these college coaches have come out and spoke on our behalf that ride these black players in football and basketball to where they're the highest paid college coaches around the country and their programs are benefiting? Not too many. And to me, their silence speaks volumes. You know what I mean? You want to go into our house as, as college players and I'm going to take care of your son. I'm going to do whatever. He's going to love it in Lexington and he's going to love it in Oklahoma or he's going to love it in, at LSU. But now when the, when, when the, you know, the shit, quote unquote, really hits the fan, you're getting these generic, you know, statements that PR people wrote for these coaches to read. And I just wish it would be more heartfelt and you had that same energy 
when you're trying to recruit us to win national championships that now you that you have for us that when our backs are against the wall and we're in this fire yeah and i'm not asking you to name names when i asked you the question you said for sure are there like instances in your head that make you sure you know that there are these people that still exist yes i've seen situations that have happened personally to me I've, I've been around other owners. I, I've played for several teams. I've talked to different um, players about situations and, 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 and not only in basketball, in football. And it, it's just a, kind of a, an unspoken thing, you know, but it, it's definitely still there. It, it's definitely prevalent. And, you know, I think the fact that they had to make the Rooney rule in the NFL, which is crazy to think that you had to make a rule that teams would at least interview one minority person for a, a management jobs tells you their train of thought in, in, in the lines that they're thinking, because most of the time they're just looking over us or not even getting up, giving us an opportunity, you know, for those. So, so some people say, you know, those jobs aren't racially filled. It's just the best man gets the job. And for the most part, that's true. But the best black candidates aren't even getting a chance. The yeah. best candidates aren't even getting a chance to interview, you know, so I'm sure you probably hired the best white person you felt fit the job but it's because you didn't give any black people a chance to even interview for the job. I was watching an interview that you did with Vlad and you had this quote. You said, to me, there will always be racism. Racism is something that's taught. We have to learn to maneuver within that. So my question, is that what you still believe? And if so, how do we win if racism will always exist? I think it's always going to exist and I still do agree with that, but I think we're to a point now where we need more white allies and, and we're starting to gain those. And I think the one thing we saw through these protests and rallies and riots, whatever you, you want to call it, we had every, every race out there, you know, every skin color, every religion, everyone came together. You know what I mean? So I think we need more that are for us and with us and, 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 and have an open mind to the tap. Because we used to give people a pass saying, well, you know, they, they didn't grow up that way or they're white or this, is, and that's why they don't understand us. And that used to be an, an okay pass that people get, but now it's not okay. You know, now you have to have an understanding and I think people are starting to do that. So I just feel like we need to call people on racism. People need to be fired from their jobs. People need to be publicly embarrassed. The world needs to know that, you know, your FedEx driver, that is delivering your packages, you know, did a protest the other day with a man, a, a knee on a man's neck talking about, you know, F George Floyd, black lives don't matter, only white lives matter. You know, so I think more than ever, you know, the, <laughs> the black culture, quote unquote, wants to be on this, this cancel culture. But to be honest with you, this cancel culture now more than ever is going to be real because we're getting people on camera who are just blatantly showing who they are and their racism. And before you know it, their, their face is circling and their name circling and then they're fired. You know, so I, when I say I think we're going to have to work within that, I think we just need to continue to have that, you know, we always got criticized. Oh, you always want to bring race in it. Why do you always want to pull the race card? Because race plays a big part in our everyday lives. And in think, everything. And people finally see that now. So, like I said, it's, it, it's a top thing. I Hopefully it's going to open up enough eyes for parents to start teaching love because your kid is going to, you know, I, like I had a conversation with my twins about the George Floyd situation and I asked them is hate taught or are you born with it and they both hesitated and they're like taught I'm like you're absolutely right like just like you can teach love and then they have a I have an 18 month old too so then one of my sons is like we're gonna have to teach Ashton how to love you know and it's really that simple you know I mean these kids are sponges so if you're they're gonna they're gonna learn and, and be whatever you feed them you know so if you're teaching them love they're going to have a better chance. So like I said, I still think there's too many people in this world that hate for no reason. If you ask to a KKK member or a white person, like, why don't you like black people? They couldn't give you no real answer. Mm -hmm. They're going to give you a, a stereotypical answer. Well, one of them robbed my cousin or they do this or they're on welfare. They, they can't give you no real answer. So they're just hating to hate. So I hope this movement changes some of that, but I'm not naive enough to think it's just going to disappear. So I think we're just going to have to, learn to maneuver within it but more white people are going to have to start calling people on this stuff just like bad cops are going to start having to call bad cops on their stuff i just think the more we expose this hate it'll eventually you know not go away but hopefully shrink um i'm ending every interview in this series with this question 
And that's that words mean different things to different people. Matt, how do you define America? A gift and a curse. Um, I think that we're very lucky in some aspects to be here and, and, and um, live this quote unquote dream because although it's been tough for me, I've been able to live a dream. I faced a ton of racism in my 40 years, but if I sit back and look at the big picture, I played 14 years in the NBA, made a lot of money, have a beautiful family, and I'm thriving in business and, and doing things to try to help other people. But at the same time, I was a lucky one. You know, we both beat the odds to be able to do what you're doing, to be able to do what I'm doing. We beat the odds. So we realize that some of our people aren't as lucky. And that's where I say it's a curse because we I've had personal friends and we've seen people that we don't even know, but grown fond of lose their life because of the color of their skin. So it, it definitely means that flag means something different to most black people. America means something different to most black people. But I think at the end of the day, we are lucky to an extent, and I think now more than ever, our voices are gonna be heard and we have a chance to change what America means and what that flag means for our children, our grandchildren and generations to come. No, that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Matt. No problem, thanks for having me, good luck.